Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. This afternoon, I am so excited to have my friend, Dr. Darren Ingalls. He's written a book. We'll talk about that. And today we're specifically going to be diving into allergies and asthma. And I know many of you either suffer from them, have suffered from them, or maybe your children or family members are suffering. So we're going to do a deep dive. And also at the end of this, we're going to be talking about another resource uh, summit that's coming up that Dr. Darren is a part of and uh, how you can get access to all of those lectures for experts um, and other information. So not only will you hear some good information today, but we'll leave you with some follow-up uh, if you want to dive deeper and get more information. Um, as always, if you have uh, listened to Pad Pod past podcast, you can find me on YouTube, on my channel, um, on Facebook. Uh, we have over a hundred episodes. We have another episode. I think it's in the early sixties with Dr. Darren. That was fun. We talked about Lyme disease in his book. Uh, let me introduce my guest and then we'll dive right in. So Dr. Darren Ingalls is a licensed naturopathic doctor, author, international speaker, and leading authority on nutritional medicine. He's a former Lyme patient who overcame his three-year battle with Lyme disease after having failed conventional treatment and becoming progressively debilitated. Dr. Ingalls found the proper diet, lifestyle, and natural therapies, working with his body to heal instead of against it. And then he applied what he learned about diet and lifestyle to his own patients and found they recovered faster with less side effects. Love that approach. Um, he's treated thousands of patients um, and his book, uh, The Lyme Solution. If you haven't got that, you definitely want to get a copy. You know, Dr. Ingalls, there's a lot of Lyme books out there. Yours is one of my favorites. I really, really, um, and I know we're going to dive into allergies and asthma, but I maybe would just start here. Do you want to give the listeners, if you've heard a past episode, you may have heard some of this, but give us just a brief snapshot of your journey of like finding how these natural medicines help to heal your own body. Yeah, well, you know, I moved to Connecticut after residency and got Lyme disease right before I opened my own practice and got treated very quickly and recovered within a matter of days. But when I started my own business, you know, like, you know, I couldn't afford staff. So I was doing everything myself and working long hours and eight months into that schedule, I relapsed and started having a lot of the symptoms come back. So I went back on antibiotics, didn't get better, changed antibiotics, didn't get better, and went through almost nine months of antibiotics and actually got a lot worse. And I was fortunate to have found a doctor in New York City named Dr. Zhang, who's a Chinese medical mm -hmm. doctor and acupuncturist. And he started treating me with Chinese herbs and acupuncture, but it was also kind of the realization that I wasn't doing everything I've told my patients to do. Yeah. I wasn't, you know, eating well and sleeping well and really taking care of my body and my body let me know. So it took another really three years to feel like I kind of got my energy back, got my life back, and eventually got to a point where I was symptom free. So I really just you know, applied what I was doing to myself, like we all do, right? Yeah. And to our patients and like, oh, this stuff actually works when you do it. Yeah. So, you know, it was just uh, my wake up call that, you know, you got to pay attention to your body and, you know, do all these things that are, you know, inherent to having a good, healthy body, you know, good sleep, good yeah. nutrition, and really taking time for yourself. I love that because it really emphasizes, especially in medicine, you know, in the world you and I have trained in and grown up in, um, there's such an emphasis on um, putting aside your needs for the sake of the patient and your career and your family. And that's all beautiful. Like it's a very sacrificial kind of mentality. But what I learned too is like, I mean, medical school for me, it was like, how long can you hold your pee and not eat and not sleep and still survive, <laughs> right? Like it was training for like ignoring any of your body signals on what your body actually needs. I, I just talked to a recent colleague and friend who has a large podcast and she was like, I had to relearn to go pee when I needed to pee because I would always be like, I have to hold this. I've got things to do. And literally she started getting bladder infections, right? Yeah. So those kind of mentality of like relearning and actually sleep does matter and relationships matter and all those things. Um, so really, really important stuff. And like I said, love your book. We'll be sure and put a link to that as well. If you haven't taken a, a look at that, what I also love about your story is antibiotics are perfectly appropriate for some people. And I use them in clinical practice, but I find like you, there's a definite percentage that don't do well. And what I love is you've given us alternatives to go down a path of really healing with a much more natural um, alternative. And I find they, the herbs and the remedies can be just as powerful and may be more sustainable because they're not destroying the microbiome and that, and that's your journey too. So thank you for bringing that information. Well, let's shift because over 50 million people in the U.S. are affected by allergies and asthma. And I want to frame this because I grew up on a farm, one of five children. My youngest brother had such severe asthma. I remember one day in a hotel that probably was moldy, where literally we were calling the ambulance and I didn't know if I was going to see him again. He was probably five or six years old. His asthma was so 
so bad. He was turning blue and he couldn't breathe. And still today it chokes me up because I'm the older sister and I see my little brother, like he can't breathe. And I'm, I'm seeing how serious it is. And one thing it led to him in his life was a deep faith because he prayed and he kind of felt like that was a piece of like, not that that fixed him, but it was the piece that like gave him a stronger sense of purpose and like felt he felt peace in the midst of not being able to breathe. And then for me, I grew up with horrendous allergies Um, I had eczema where I'd bleed on the sheets at night. My skin was so itchy and excoriated. And I, for like during harvest season, September through March, I had to stay inside. It also created part of my love for books because I couldn't be outside on the farm. It was corn and soybeans and the dust. And I was so allergic. So this topic is so relevant to me personally. Now at this point, because I've done all the work around it, I don't have allergies anymore. I really don't. But let's go in. I know. Thank goodness. It's amazing. Uh, Tell us though. I mean, this is a big problem. I think it's very relevant. And I think even post COVID, the mast cell stuff, give me a framework of how you're seeing this and how many more people are being affected and how big is the problem? (laughs) Well, it's an enormous problem and it's getting worse. I mean, that's the sad thing about this. You know, you know, 50 million people, I think is probably generous. You know, I mean, my practice is filled with people dealing with allergy and asthma. And you know, again, I work with a lot of people with Lyme disease and autoimmune disease, but you know, there's this element of, of allergy in a lot of people. You know, asthma may be a little bit different, but if you think about what we define as allergy, if you think about it, it's more than just hay fever, you know, that includes a lot of different things. You know, I mean, allergy can affect, of course, you know, the itchy eyes, the runny nose, the sneezing, but it's the chronic chest congestion, it's the chronic eczema, it's the chronic gastrointestinal problems. And even a lot of neuropsychiatric symptoms can be a sign of allergy. And if you've got a child that's having pans, or if you've got chronic migraines, you would never even think that allergy might be part of that. Yeah, we know there are some people that have a lot of mast cells in their brain, and when they get allergy, they don't get hay fever, they get neurological right. symptoms. So if, if we broaden our idea of what allergy really means, because you know, in the conventional allergy world, allergists look at a very strict definition of allergy being an IgE mediated reaction, and that's part of it. But it's interesting when you read European journals versus American journals on allergy, their definition is much broader and encompasses IgE, IgG, there's T cell mediated. And so there's a lot of different ways our immune system can create symptoms that we kind of loosely define as allergy. But, you know, the fact that there's so much environmental influence of creating allergy, yes, there is a genetic disposition. We know if one parent is allergic, there's about a 20% chance your child will be allergic. If both parents are allergic or have allergies, it goes up to like 80%. So there's a huge genetic disposition. But look around our environment. I mean, it's toxicity, glyphosate, herbicides, pesticides, phthalates. I mean, the list goes on and on. And all of that creates this environment where our immune system honestly just gets confused and it can't distinguish what's part of our world, what's not part of our world. And then we get just this mass collection of symptoms. So I love how you frame that because the environmental toxicity, which is one of my passions is so crucial to this. And if I look back at my brother and I, both of us suffering from me from allergies severe and him from severe asthma, we grew up on a farm, wonderful place, but lots of toxic chemicals and unbeknownst because my parents didn't know any better. Um, and I think that in probably well water that was contaminated, whatever those things were, I think of both of our toxic load plus the um, genetic component of our parents. So that frames it well. Um, why do you think that, say you compared to 10 or 20 years ago, this is increasing so much? Um, do you think it's just environmental toxic load or any other things that you would contribute to that? Well, I think our toxic load has definitely increased. You know, consider the average American gets exposed over 80,000 chemicals a year. But we've now got research showing that there's up to a three generational transmission of these chemicals. So it's not even the toxins that you and I are getting exposed to on our own. It's what our parents and our grandparents got exposed to that some of that's getting passed on. So it's almost like we're kind of weakening, you know, each generation as our world environment, I said, gets worse. So I think that's a big underlying factor. And and if that's true, which I believe it is, it's going to take three generations to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. By the time we start to reduce that toxic load. And again, you know, we're dealing with so many different uh, areas of exposure between what we eat, what we breathe, what we drink, you know, all of that keeps filling up our bucket. And we know when the bucket overflows, that's when we become more symptomatic. 
So, you know, you and I talk so much with our patients and out there in the public about, you know, control what you can, control your environment. That's the best that you can do. That's clean water, good air filters. Make sure your home is a safe haven. That's a really great low hanging fruit thing you can do to lower that body burden. But at the end of the day, you know, once the immune system gets sensitized, you know, we've now got that disposition that, you know, if you're allergic to mold or pollen or cat dust a dog, you know, those triggers, you know, can set you off and lowering the load definitely helps. But often we've got to find other strategies to recorrect the immune system when it goes awry. So I love it because you're like, what I always say, clean air, clean water, clean food, start with the basics that aren't super hard. They're low hanging fruit in your bedroom, in your environment. You want to do whatever you can to contain the allergens there. Make sure you have a good air filtration and, you know, the hypoallergic kinds of sheets and stuff. What would you say? We talked about like for me and my brother, childhood allergies, which is super common and they often last through life and kind of you know, get worse or better at times. What about someone in their forties or fifties or, or on, and they start to develop new allergies? Is there any other different things that you think about for that? Tell us about that. Cause we might have, I have a lot of women listeners and, and women who've said they've developed new allergies, new mast cell symptoms. What would you say to a patient who presented like that? Well, I think this idea that you get allergies as a child and grow out of it, that's the exception more than the rule. (laughs) And, you know, for the children who develop allergies, you know, two, three, four years old, usually by the time they're five, six years old, they start to grow out of them. And beyond that, you know, it's like the longer you walk the planet, the more susceptible you become. So when I see, you know, older people, older, I'll say older being, you know, someone probably over 30 (laughs) that starts to develop, you know, allergies, you know, again, there's so many different things that can dispose at that point. You know, one of the biggest thing I see in my practice is infection. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, Lyme disease. I have people who've never had an allergy in their life. And after they get Lyme disease, now they're sensitive to food. They're mm-hmm. sensitive to mold and pollen and chemicals bother them. And, you know, computers and electromagnetic frequencies bother yeah. them. So, you know, infection can be another route to sensitize your immune system to your world. So that is probably one of the most common things I see. But I think it's also, uh, again, an element of toxicity that it may take 30 or 40 years for your bucket to fill up. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, depending on where you live in the world and what your exposures are. I mean, if you live in, you know, downtown New York City, where there's a lot of, you know, urban pollution, or if you said you live on a farm where there's a lot of spraying of chemicals, you know, your exposure might be higher than someone else who's just in a regular suburban neighborhood that has the normal everyday junk we all get exposed to. So it's a combination, again, I think of, you know, exposure, toxicity, but infection is that one piece I really uh, think people need to be aware of because, again, when I see someone who is a little bit older that has sort of new onset allergies or even asthma, uh, I think about infection being a trigger. Yeah. I love that. Cause I, the toxin infection thing, I always think is that's at the core of functional medicine and what we do with the complex chronic things. And what I hear you saying, which is interesting. Someone had asked me as I posted about the summit, you're going to be hosting in a few weeks, or actually when you hear this, probably this week, um, and, and on, um, one person was saying, well, is it just the classical allergies or is it more like is it the food sensitivities? And, and what you're saying is it's, we've got the classical allergy, you know, skin prick test and the IgE mediated stuff. Like I had with corn and soybeans and things and asthma. And then you also have the IgE. G. And like I said, in Europe, they think bigger where food sensitivities, and then you have chemical sensitivity, like the multiple chemical sensitivity bucket. And then we have mast cell activation. And then here we have eosinophilic diseases. I love this though, because it really covers all the weird things the immune system can do in reacting to outside chemicals or triggers. Um, so it's actually a lot bigger than just allergies, but I love that you're that broad because it's relevant. Yeah. For- well, you know, it's interesting. I'm seeing a lot of kids in my practice too. I mean, I can't tell me because I see now with eosinophilic esophagitis. Yes. yes. I don't ever remember seeing this when I was in med school, resident. I mean, that was a yes. rare thing. And now it's really common. I'm like, why do we have all these kids that yes. are getting this kind of allergic esophagitis? You know, is it the food that they're eating? Is it something that happens in utero? I don't have the answer to that, but I just think it it's another marker yes. that we've got this very toxic society that's obviously influencing, you know, young children. Hey everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, 
you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. No young children. I love that you said that because that in medical school for me too, it's taught as like a zebra, which means it's really rare. You may not even see this same thing yeah. nowadays. It's, it's all the time, probably once a month, I see a case it's, it's amazingly common. Um, and I think it is, uh, I heard Stephanie said, I'm talking about glyphosate and the uh, way it attaches to the gluten molecule and how it's actually creating, potentially creating more celiac and non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is just another right. immune reaction, right? It's not exactly allergy, but it's the same bucket of these immune reactions. And so they're seeing exponential increases in cases of true celiac and non-celiac gluten sensitivity with the exposure to glyphosate treated wheat, right? So it's all, it's a yeah. new to nature molecule that our body was like, wait, what is this? We thought it was wheat, but it doesn't look like the wheat that we used to know. And I think that's relevant. Um, so talk about some natural therapies. Uh, like when you say a patient that, you know, let's say 35 year old, really severe allergies, uh, maybe a little chemical sensitivity, where would you start? What would you give them? Besides we talked about clean air, clean water basics there. What else would you do? Well, always diet and gut, right? That's the foundation of everything. So we need to make sure you're eating good, clean, healthy, organic food as much as possible. The less hands that touch your food, the better. And you know, if you're having a lot of gastrointestinal problems, you know, understand that up to 80% of your immune function comes from the gut. Mm -hmm. So if the gut's not functioning well, again, your disposition towards allergy and or autoimmunity goes up exponentially. So we need to make sure you have healthy elimination, you know, you poop at least once, if not twice a day or more, depending depending on how much you eat. So that's, that's foundational. And then beyond that, you know, there's a lot of things we can do in the natural world for symptomatic control. You know, in the conventional world, of course, it's antihistamines, things like Zyrtec, Allegra, Claritin, Benadryl. Uh, they use other types of things like uh, Singular, which is a leukotriene inhibitor, or they might use mast cell stabilizers. And I know a lot of the people in the mast cell world, it's like, yes, let's do all of it. <laughs> you know, H1 blockers, H2 blockers, leukotriene inhibitors, they kind of throw the kitchen sink at you. And that's fine. And there are times where, look, if you're having an asthma attack, please take your steroid inhaler, take albuterol, it's going to save your life. But long term, that's not a great solution. And again, you know, all these medications come with side effects. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things we can do naturally. I mean, you know, vitamin C is a great natural mast cell stabilizer and does so many other great generous. things for connective tissue and your immune system. We've got things like quercetin, which is another great mast cell inhibitor. So we have a lot of good mast cell inhibitors, quercetin, luteolin, PEA, uh, chromalin sodium, which is kind of a semi-synthetic bioflavonoid, uh, works really well. But I think if we really want to get to the root of the problem, in addition to all the things we just talked about, you know, immunotherapy is the most effective way I've seen to correct the immune system. I mean, like permanently. Yeah. Again, you know, we, we rarely use the C word, the cure word, but yeah. I have seen patients whose allergies were cured, you know, when we started doing immunotherapy. Let's talk a little bit about that. Cause of course me with allopathic medicine, we aren't really taught this. And a lot of my colleagues like you uh, teach us, and then we can go to seminars and learn. I don't actually do this in my practice, but I'm very familiar with the power. So tell people who've never heard of immunotherapy, what is it, how does it work? And uh, what do you do? Sure. Well, immunotherapy, immune therapy is that we're trying to change the way your immune system reacts to a different allergen. So if you consider that it's really an overreaction of your immune system, right? You know, why do some people allergic to cats and other people aren't? There's just something in your immune system that recognizes that being foreign and creates this reaction. So in conventional allergy, they would do allergy shots, what they call subcutaneous immunotherapy. You go in every week, they inject you with dust or ragweed or cat or whatever it is you're allergic to. And then over time, they build your immune tolerance and then you get to a point of being on maintenance and then you don't go every week you're going maybe every three weeks or every four weeks and that goes on for many years in our world instead of doing the allergy shots we can do what's called sublingual immunotherapy so sublingual means under the tongue so the concept is exactly the same is that we're still giving you the thing that bothers you but instead of going to the allergist every week these are drops you do at home you put the drops under the tongue, but it desensitizes you to whatever allergen is in that mix. And so again, we can test people, find out what you're allergic to, and then we put those allergens in bottles and we mix them based on the different allergy type. But 
over time, again, it builds your immune tolerance. So these things stop bothering you. And what's amazing is that how quickly it can work for people. I mean, I have, you know, kids come in with head to toe eczema and they come back a month later and their skin's almost completely clear. People with a chronic congestion, runny nose, within a matter of four to six weeks, they can start to breathe again and they don't feel all boggy. So, you know, it's a very safe, effective method. And it's really interesting because it's widely used throughout Europe. Yeah. In fact, in most countries, it's the preferred method over allergy shots. And it's also a quarter of the price of allergy shots. But unfortunately, in the U.S., allergists get reimbursed for doing allergy shots. So there's really no financial impetus to want to change to switching yeah. to the drops under the tongue. But there's over a thousand studies on sublingual immunotherapy. They've done it in children, adults. It's safe for everyone. Uh, very effective therapy. And I also like to do what's called LDA or low dose allergy therapy. And LDA is a little bit different. These are mixes that are made by a pharmacy. And so there's a food mix, there's an inhalant mix, which is mold and pollen and cat and dust and dog and feather, pretty much anything you breathe in. And then there's a chemical mix. So what a lot of people like about LDA is that there's really no testing involved. It's not necessary because we give it to you based on your clinical history. So if we know that food bothers you or mold bothers you, pollen bothers you, we can just give it without the testing. And the idea behind it is that each mix may have 60, 70 different things in it. So if you're allergic to 10 of them, we cover the 10 and the other 50 or 60, well, who cares because right. you're not allergic. Yeah. So this has been around actually since the 1960s. It was developed by a doctor in the UK. He was an ENT surgeon named Len McEwen. And he discovered that when you dilute these extracts out, I mean, a lot more than what a conventional allergist would use, and you mix it with an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase, it modulates whatever you mix it with to, again, desensitize you. Wow. So we've used this for people to have like legitimate anaphylactic reactions. Mm -hmm. It's so dilute, it's yeah. even safe in this population of people. Wow. But again, it's a really easy way to control food allergies, environmental allergies, chemical sensitivities. And again, the ultimate goal is still the same is that we're trying to retrain the immune system to stop being so overreactive. Uh, this is tremendous. And uh, um, again, if stay tuned, whether you're watching this live on Facebook or YouTube or any channel, you're going to find the link to the allergy and asthma summit below. And I hope you check that out because if you like this information, you're going to get it times a hundred with all the experts that are speaking there. Um, so stay tuned. That's linked. Actually, if you're listening now, the link is right in there. Check it out. Now I've got a few questions, Dr. Darren, that I think would be relevant. Andrea asked. So my allergist says that there were many restrictions and only certain things and he couldn't do mold. Um, any thoughts on that? I'm assuming this is a traditional allergist. And I'm assuming, like you said, one thing you just said was in the LDA, it's safe for someone who's had anaphylaxis, whereas maybe allergy shots would not be. Do you think that's what... Yeah, that can be. I mean, it is some people when they do allergy shots will start to have an anaphylactic reaction and then they have to stop. They can't do it. And yeah. there's no there's no option at that point other than medication. Yeah. So for someone who's that hypersensitive, LDA would be a great option. The other thing, too, if you're getting allergy shots, understand that that's going to be completely based on either your skin prick testing or blood testing that only looks at IgE. Yes. Well, we know from the research that a lot of mold reactions don't involve IgE. Yes. So I've had patients who've had, you know, conventional allergy testing for mold comes back completely negative, but every time it rains, every time they go into a damp basement, they get in a moldy environment, they feel the reaction. So clinically, they're telling you they're allergic to mold. It just didn't show up on a test. So I see a lot of under treatment yeah. with conventional allergy shots only because they're limiting that to IgE reactions alone. Oh, I love that. I want to just repeat it because I think this is such an important point that you just made. Your classical allergist, there's a place for them. We're not saying that's bad, but their narrow right. spectrum of what they're checking is just an IgE reaction, which is considered the classical allergy. And as I mentioned before, we're looking now at T cell, mast cell, IgE, uh, sorry, IgG, even IgM and IgA. You could have an IgA reaction on the gut and have a stomach ache or have a increased permeability. And these things aren't going to be classically tested. So you may not notice um, a difference or you may miss things that are, whereas with the immunotherapy, the slit therapy or the LDA, you're actually covering a much uh, greater multitude of reactions, correct? Absolutely. So, you know, that's the beauty of immunotherapy is that it kind of doesn't matter what the reaction is. You know, I've had hours to say, well, it's not allergy. Okay. It's a sensitivity. It's an intolerance. You know, now we're just, you know, haggling well, over names. Right. Yeah. In fact, there's an immune reaction that is causing symptoms. 
Yeah. And like you said, I, I've studied this years ago, even though I don't do it, I've referred to it. I, and I want to ask in a minute where people can find people who do this. But um, I remember seeing the European studies. This is very clearly science-based. There's no question. Uh, it's just that it's not the standard of care because it's not the standard reimbursed care, which is often what things do, at least in the U.S. under our you know traditional allopathic system, which is the primary system for reimbursement. So it's a lot to do with reimbursement, not to do with science. Um, I have another question here from Leanna. I tried immunotherapy years ago. It doesn't say exactly which type, but it made my eosinophilic esophagitis worse. My doctor thinks it was preservative, a phenol, and I started to react to each drop. So do you do preservative free? Is there something that could be in those mixes that could react as a Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is a problem. We, there used to be a company called Antigen Labs. That They were the only company that made preservative-free antigens, and they went out of business many years ago. And so it's actually an FDA requirement that they have to put phenol yep. in some of the extracts. So what we often do for people who are sensitive is that we desensitize them to phenol right. before we start their immunotherapy. Brilliant. So that oh, they brilliant. can tolerate it. Now that's only if you're doing conventional allergy shots or sublingual immunotherapy. LDA does not have phenol in it at all. So for someone who's that sensitive, I would rather them do LDA. Fantastic. Um, and then where could people find, I know there's some organizations that train, but say someone's out there and like, who do I find in my area that does this? How would they find someone? Yeah, the best way is to find a doctor that's trained through the American Academy of Environment, Environmental Medicine. It's aaemonline.org. Unfortunately, AAEM, I think, was the American Academy of Emergency Medicine, yeah. so that got taken. So it's aaemonline.org, and you can find a practitioner, and many of the members of that academy have been trained in immunotherapy. Many of them do it, and you can probably find someone more local to your area. Perfect. Although I should say in the era of COVID, so many of us have been working remotely with patients mm -hmm. that there are ways to work with practitioners yeah. remotely. If that's, if you can't find someone in your local area, uh, you can definitely reach out uh, to other doctors and see if that's an option. Mm, that's fantastic. And are you taking patients, clients, Dr. Ingalls? We still are. Yes. Okay, good. So obviously we can send them to you too. And again, wherever you're watching this links will be below or wherever you're watching this for all the things we're mentioning. So don't worry if you missed it. If you're driving in your car, you can grab that. Um, so obviously I've mentioned the summit. That's one of the reasons why we're here. Cause I really believe in this. And I told you my little personal snippet because I really, really suffered from allergies and asthma and almost saw my brother die from asthma. So it's close to my heart. Um, tell people just a little bit about the summit, what they can expect if they join. And that'll be when you're listening to this, either coming up really soon or live this week. Yeah. So it's an allergies and asthma summit and it's goes from March 13th through March 19th. And it's completely free. All you have to do is just sign up and then every day you're going to get access to seven or eight different speakers. And we've got speakers, experts from all over the world that talk about different aspects of how allergy impacts your health. So we've got everything from regular seasonal allergies. I've spoken with a couple of ENT surgeons. We've talked to people about eczema. Dr. Anna Maria Temple, who's an eczema expert, had a great talk of that. Dr. Lisa Song talked about how allergies affect children. Yeah. And we talked about like the neuropsychiatric effects of allergy, which grossly gets overlooked. So again, we've got almost 50 speakers covering the bases on everything allergy and asthma related. And the goal is really to empower you to take stock of your health. And this doesn't mean you just throw your medication out the door and, you know, start taking a bunch of natural stuff, but we want to give people, you know, an understanding that there are options and that there is a way to improve your health. So hopefully you can get off the medication. So, you know, we just want to invite everyone to take part again, it's completely free. And we have all these downloadable guides that are absolutely free. We put together our team, this great, I think it's like an 80 page guide on natural treatments for allergies and asthma. So there's so many great free resources. Uh, we just want people to take advantage of that. And, you know, they'll have the option at the end, if you really enjoyed it, you can buy it. And then you can keep going back to it over and over again. And again, I think people are going to find really a lot of value. So share it with anyone, you know, dealing with allergies and asthma. And I think uh, people are going to really enjoy it. Uh, Dr. Ingalls, as always, it is such a pleasure to talk to you. I love your um, heart and soul for helping people in the world. The fact that you continue to put great information out. Um, and we just put this together real quickly because we're like, I want to get the word out. So thank you for even today making time to talk to us. Um, so appreciate the work that you do. Uh, well, thank you so much, Jill, for having me. You're welcome.